Hey everybody, this is Holly Priestley, Queen Bee of Honeycomb Coaching, and I live in my 1997 Ford E350 with a fiberglass high top club wagon, so it's extended, uh, with my dog Mona Lisa Priestley. And today I want to make a little video on um, how to pick the right van for you if you're considering van life. And I'm going to focus a lot on vans, but I'm going to reference RVs and cars and SUVs as well because I want to make sure that I cover most of the bases and answer a lot of the questions that I had when I was looking for a van, as well as some questions that have come up throughout my time from other people considering the van life. So if you want to hear more about that, please stick around. <music> to know before you even start thinking about buying a van is what your lifestyle is going to be like in the van. So that can be really hard to anticipate because you've never done it before and you have lived in a house for a while and you're just thinking about van life, but your lifestyle with the van, with the vehicle, is going to determine your answers to pretty much all of the rest of the questions that are coming in this video. So you need to consider whether you're going to be living in it full-time or part-time whether you're uh, retiring, vacationing, or whether you're gonna continue to work, whether you're working a nine to five office job, or whether you work for yourself, or whether you work remotely, you need to consider how many people or beings are gonna be in the van, whether it's just you, you and your partner, you and your dog, you and your family, whether that's kids or pets or adults or whatever it is. You need to know what your lifestyle is so that you can determine the answers to every single question that I will ask you from here on out. So once you have your lifestyle kind of, sort of dialed in-ish, the next biggest thing, arguably, is going to be the cost of the vehicle. So that includes the upfront cost of purchasing the vehicle. It also includes the build-out, whether it's built out already or not the maintenance costs, the maintenance for the build-out items, and the maintenance for the vehicle itself. That includes insurance costs, as well as basic running costs like gas and that sort of thing. So basically, when you're buying a vehicle, there are two main ways to go about it. You either buy it in cash or you get financing. So if you're paying for a vehicle in cash, that more or less determines your budget right there, however much you have on hand or are able to save before you have to purchase your vehicle. Getting financing for a van can be a little bit tricky depending on what you're actually buying. If you're getting an RV, then you can usually get some kind of financing because it's an RV. If you're getting a blank, empty canvas of a van, you can generally get financing because it's a blank, empty canvas of a van. If you're buying a van in any state of conversion, whether it's half converted like mine was when I bought it, or fully converted by a human and not like a giant company, sometimes it can be tricky to get financing for those types of vehicles because banks, credit unions, other financiers don't see it uh, the same way that you do, right? So if it's a self-converted vehicle, they will loan on the Kelly Blue Book value or instead of the KBB plus the conversion value. So I bought my van in cash because A, I didn't want to have to deal with a car loan and that extra payment and that extra stressor. And also because I couldn't really get financing because I was buying a half converted van. And I'm self-employed and my taxes made it look like I made no money last year. So financing was pretty much off the table for me. It might not be for you, but that's something that you will decide for yourself. Whether you want to maintain a car loan payment or not. My recommendation is not, but you do you. I know a lot of people who bought their vans with payments and they're paying them off and they kind of consider them like a rent payment every month and that works for them. So whatever works for you, works for you. You need to consider, again, like I said, going back to that lifestyle thing. Are you retiring? Are you vacationing? Are you going to keep working? Because that will determine the cost that you're willing to put towards your van. Maintenance costs for vans also will vary greatly. There's kind of a, a rule of thumb that, you know, the newer the vehicle, the fewer times you have to take it to the mechanic to get something fixed. 
the older the vehicle, the more mileage, the more often it might have to be fixed, maintained, repaired, taken to the mechanic. That will add more costs. And then insurance is something that a lot of people have questions about because it can be really hard to insure different types of vehicles. RVs have RV insurance and conversion vans have different types of insurance that they can fall underneath. For my vehicle and my lifestyle, I have car insurance for the car part, and then I have renter's insurance for everything that's in it. So my computer, my camera, all of my things um, that are in it. And I can do that because I am storing a couple of boxes of sentimental items at my folks' house, and I can use that as the address for my renter's insurance. That should be a good starting point for thinking about costs for your van. The next thing that you probably want to consider is the size of the van, whether it's going to be a regular length van or an extended length van or a low top or a high top or a pop top. There are a lot of different options out there for sizing. And again, that will go back to your lifestyle, whether there's just one person in there or two people or a family or a person and a dog, as in my case. And then also how much time you're going to be spending in the van. If you work from home like I do, then it might be more important for you to be able to stand up and stretch and be comfortable in your van. But if you work outside of your van, maybe in an office or something, some other job away from your location, then having a low top might be fine for you. Your own size will matter more for the size of the van you get. So I'm not a very tall person. I'm about 5'2", five 5'3", five and I can fit sleeping horizontally the width of the van, but anybody who's even an inch taller than me will probably have to sleep lengthwise in the van, and that will determine the size of the bed that you build, which will determine the rest of your living space arrangement, as well as whether you're going to have a permanent sink stove cabinet area or whether it's going to be an outdoor kitchen if you're staying in some place warm all the time. Your lifestyle will determine that as well. The longer vans may provide issues with finding parking a little bit easier. Also, the high top vans won't fit in parking garages or, you know, most of those places where they have that bar that says, you know, like nine feet or whatever. I don't know exactly how tall my van is, but I know that the last time I took it to my mechanic, he said they had to take the garage doors off the chains so that they could get it in. That's another thing to consider is the size of the vehicle because I've had some mechanics tell me that, you know, they can't work on my van because they don't have enough clearance in their shop for it. So if you're in a colder climate, the high top, low top, hop top will determine what kind of heating it'll require. Generally, a bigger space will require more heating and the low tops will heat up a little bit faster. You can use less of the propane or the electricity or whatever it is that you're using to heat your vehicle. Based on my research, a pop top and a high top require the same sort of heating unless it's windy outside. There is another YouTube channel, I think it's called Living the Van Life, I'll link to it um, when I find it, and he talks about having his own pop-top vehicle and heating it in the middle of a blizzard or a winter storm, so he'll have a little bit more information for you there. Another lifestyle thing to consider if you are going to be buying a van that is half converted or fully converted or even an RV are the conveniences and that will greatly depend on your lifestyle and where you're going to be and how you're going to be living. So that might include a bathroom, a sink, a stove, an oven, a permanent bed versus a convertible bed table, how you're charging your house batteries, whether that's shore power only or alternator or solar panel, things like that. So I'm going to touch on this a lot more in another video later, more about van builds and how to design yours, but I want to touch on it a little bit here because I know some people are going to be buying fully converted, half converted vans or complete RVs. In my van, again, I live in it full time, I'm self-employed, it's just me and my dog, uh, so that's my situation. Um, I do have a permanent sink stove cabinet. Um, a lot of van people have the uh, camper stoves that you can like pull out and put away or you know take outside or whatever. Mine is completely permanently built into my van, which is great because I live in an environment where it is cold or wet. 
Um, and I don't necessarily want to be committed to cooking outside all the time. I love being able to cook inside my van, especially in the wintertime. It uh, warms up the van as well as warming up my food. Um, I don't have an oven and I love to bake. So that's been kind of a bummer, except that I can just go to my friend's houses and bake there. And then usually I don't even want to eat the stuff that I bake. I just like the process of baking. So then I leave it with them. But that's a little bit of a tangent just on my personal lifestyle. Um, I don't have a shower um, or a toilet built into the van. But if you saw my other video on frequently asked questions, I touch on how I handle those things. Um, I shower uh, at the gym. I use baby wipes to clean myself a lot. Um, and I do laundry at friends' houses. Uh, luckily, I haven't had to go to a laundromat in a while. I don't really like laundromats personally. The next little bit is going to be about my bathroom setup. So if you don't want to hear about that, skip ahead. I'll put a timestamp here for when you can safely come back and I won't talk about bathroom stuff anymore. So I do have a pee bottle and a funnel. And then I also have a luggable loo and a bucket and the appropriate bags for that for my bathroom situation. There are a lot of vans out there that do have fully built in showers and things like that. That just requires a lot more um, water holding tanks for fresh water and for gray water. And then it would also require a water heating and or pressurizing system. Um, again, I don't have one of those, so I don't know a ton about them. As far as not having an oven goes, I know there are ways that you can basically bake in a Dutch oven or in a cast iron pan. So I'm going to experiment with those as soon as I get a cast iron pan. I know I don't have one yet, I need to, but that's where we're at. Another thing that people always ask about is refrigeration. And I don't have a refrigerator in my van. They do make RV refrigerators or small, you know, 12 volt refrigerators. Um, I am just using a really cheap old cooler right now. And that's working for me for a couple of reasons. One being that it's been winter primarily, so I don't really need to worry about keeping things cold. Um, but even when I was in the desert, it was fine. Um, part of that is because I'm a vegetarian and so I don't need to keep meat cold. I don't buy eggs, so I don't need to worry about keeping them cold. I don't do milk, so I don't need to worry about keeping that cold. Um, the majority of the food that I eat is a lot of fresh produce or hummus or cheese or pastas, crackers, breads, peanut butter and jelly. Um, things that have a more flexible shelf temperature life. I'm not sure that that's the proper way to say that, but I don't know the proper way, so bear with me. Um, so if you do eat meat, want eggs, want milk, want cold water all the time, uh, then yeah, consider buying a, a van or an RV that has the capabilities of having a fridge or has a fridge already in it. So again, I'm not gonna talk too much more about the conveniences associated with buying your van because I'm gonna do a whole nother video specifically on builds, build design, build conveniences, things like that. So if you have any other specific questions that I can address in that future video, drop them in the comments or send me a message and I will be sure to get those. Moving on. Another thing you're gonna to wanna to consider when you're buying a vehicle is its abilities. And that 100% goes back to your lifestyle. Where are you going to go in your van? What are you gonna want it to do for you? If you're going to be in the city versus in the wilderness, if you're gonna be in the mountains versus the desert, if you're gonna be in the snow versus the sand, depending on each of those, you might want four wheel drive, which generally costs more upfront to purchase, but can get you into, into and out of more predicaments. If two wheel drive is acceptable, then you need to decide between front wheel or rear wheel, which one is going to be better for your lifestyle. Are you gonna be in the snow or are you gonna be in the sand? When you're considering the abilities of your vehicle, you also want to know whether you're going to be taking it on long trips or short trips. Are you going to be living in it in your own town where you work and you're not necessarily going to take it on cross country road trips, then maybe it doesn't need to be, you know, as big or as capable or newer or have lower miles to accommodate those travels. But if you are going to be using it to travel from one side of the country to the other or one side of the continent to the other, then you might want it to be a little more durable, have fewer miles so that you can pack on more and have lower maintenance costs so that you spend more time on the road and less time in the mechanic's office. So I've mentioned it a lot. I might as well just bring it up now. Whether you are handy or whether you are a mechanic, 
will also determine the kind of vehicle you get. I personally am not a mechanic. I don't know very many things about cars. I know a lot more now than I did when I started the process, tell you what, but I still pretty much know nothing about cars. So getting a reliable vehicle to me was the most important thing. And no matter what you're buying, especially if it's used, if you're buying it off Craigslist or Facebook or the newspaper or from a friend, always, always, always take it to a mechanic that you trust for a pre-purchase checkup. They will go through the mechanics of the vehicle, not usually the RV parts if there are some already in there, but they'll go through the engine and the tires and all of those things just to make sure that you're not buying a lemon. And I really, really, really recommend that. Sometimes it costs, sometimes it doesn't. It depends on your mechanic. Um, but even if it does cost something, it'll probably be about 100 bucks, depending. And that is $100, 100% well spent because you know whether you're buying a vehicle that's going to get you the lifestyle that you want or not. So I will take away my soapbox right now, but that is really important and I highly recommend everybody do that, especially with used vehicles. Some vehicles, vans especially, require a little bit more specific knowledge or specific parts if something happens or even for routine maintenance. Sprinters are huge uh, in this category. They're, they're huge because a lot of people really want to buy them for van life because they're known to be durable and spacious and reliable vehicles. But also if something happens to them, then you can't necessarily just take it to any old shop and have them fix it, especially the newer ones. There are very specific parts, very specific knowledge and education required uh, to fix a Sprinter. Um, Volkswagens are very similar. They're iconic and a lot of people want to drive them and, you know, they're, they're really cool or they're cute or whatever it is that attracts people to V-dubs. But they also have a very specialized part and skill set associated with fixing them if something goes wrong. So if you're planning on taking it all over the country and you might end up, you know, broken down in some tiny little town, their mechanic might not be able to help you. So that's something you need to consider. If you're handy and you're able to tackle a lot of your own mechanical issues, by all means, go that route. I didn't even consider getting a VW with mine because I am not handy and I knew that that would stress me out even more. Fords, Dodges, GMCs, those other kinds of vehicles that are a little bit more common and or made in America, generally, not always, are a little bit cheaper and easier to fix. So if my van broke down in the middle of the desert in some tiny rinky-dink little town, it's still a Ford, and I still trust that mechanic to be able to figure out what the issue is. And then along with that, being handy or mechanically inclined, if it's going to be a conversion van, or an RV, it will have RV parts potentially, and mechanics and RV repair people don't always overlap. So if you have a high top van with RV parts and it's having a problem, you might have to call around to RV shops that can fit it, but then that can also work on the engine part and not just the RV part. So the RV part would include, you know, sink, stove, refrigerator, electrical, all of the back end, like house stuff, and the mechanic stuff is all of the car stuff, the engine, the tires, the, all of those things that come along with a regular car. They don't usually overlap in my experience. They are two totally separate things, separate skill sets, separate mechanics. So if you're handy, by all means, do all the things. If you're not handy, then these are things that you need to consider. And the last thing that you really need to consider, again, based on your lifestyle, is how stealth you want this to be. If you're living in a city, more stealth is usually mo better. You don't necessarily want to make it obvious that you're living out of your vehicle. Even if you live somewhere where it's legal to do that, and a lot of places it's not currently, you don't want to creep out the people that are around you. Nor do you want to make it look enticing like somebody's living in it. If you're going to be living in the wilderness and on BLM land and in forest service land, by all means, you know, make it look like an RV or buy the RV or the camper or whatever. I live in the city and I knew that I was going to be in the city at least 50% of the time so I didn't want my vehicle to look like somebody was living in it and it's not the most stealth vehicle in the world but it also isn't the least stealth vehicle in the world. 
So this kind of comes back to whether you're thinking low top, high top, or pop top. Low tops generally don't look like people are living in them unless you like know what to look for. High tops don't usually look like people are living in them, but they can be a little bit more obvious. Pop tops, if you pop it in the city, it looks like you're living in it. There's nothing you can do about that. So if you're going to get a pop top and live in the city, you might not pop that top very much. Something to consider. So it might be a 50-50 low top, high top at that point. When you're in the wilderness, pop that top all you want. When you're in the city, keep it down so that it's not super obvious. Another thing to consider when it comes to stealth is whether there are windows on your van or not. A lot of the big box type vans, uh, Sprinters, Transits, Promasters, don't usually have windows on the sides. Um, some of them do, some of them don't. My van came with windows all around because it was a passenger vehicle before it was a conversion van. And windows can really give you away uh, if you're living in it or not. One of the best things about my vehicle is that it is super tinted. So during the day, you can't tell whether I'm in there or not. And then at night, I put Reflectix up on the windows, but I put black fabric on one side of them so that when it's against the black tint, you can't really see the shiny Reflectix bubble wrappy type material on the inside either. Curtains are another big thing. I think they look really nice and I would love to have some, but they are a lot more obvious as far as, hey, somebody lives in here, there's a curtain, look at this curtain. And they don't necessarily keep the light in at night. Um, and at night is usually when it's the most obvious whether somebody's living in it or not. So you wanna keep the light in as much as possible so that it doesn't seep out, people can't see you, they can't tell that you're in there. If you have a van that you wanna make look more like a work van, there are a couple of workarounds around that. You could get a magnet that has some kind of business name on it to put on the side of your van when you're in the city, or you could install a ladder on the top of it because a lot of work vans have ladders on them, or you could get some orange cones or an orange vest to like lay over the driver's seat. That's usually a pretty good disguise also to make your home look like a work van. I think that's everything that I could think of as far as knowing which van is right for you. If you have any additional questions, please don't hesitate to leave them in the comments or send me a message on Instagram or Facebook under Honeycomb Coaching. I've also recently started a Patreon, so if you want to get behind the scenes or bloopers reels or any of my own personal tips and tricks or even to see these videos before they actually go out to the public, head over there and subscribe to that. I have it set up so that every pledge amount gets the same benefits because I think it's important that if you're supporting me, I wanna give you all the same value. So subscribe to this channel, like it, leave a comment if you have one. Come over and follow me on Instagram or Facebook and head over to Patreon to support more of these videos and adventures. Have a great day.